Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to episode 85 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Yes, I'm back in the studio again. It's been a long time since I recorded an episode here, and it's nice to be back home for a while. For those of you on the email distribution list for Easing Anxiety, um, you know about, about Bear. Some of you listening to this podcast may not know. I'm, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to mention it briefly that we unfortunately lost our dog, um, had to say goodbye to our dog Bear a couple of weeks ago. The cancer finally um, overtook him, and so we had to make a decision to to ease his pain and, and say goodbye to him. It's been really hard. Um, just a lot of difficulty and tears around here. So many of you from the email distribution list have reached out, and I'm overwhelmed by the the um the output of emotion and support and I just want to thank you all so much. It's been incredible and I am very, very grateful. But um I don't want to spend a lot of time on the negativity here. So we're gonna try to shift gears because I feel like I've done enough of that lately. Just so you know my folks uh still working that problem back in Kansas City, but we were back there for a week, just got back in town this past weekend and um got their house on the market and sold in one day. So that's really good news. I think we found a new long-term facility for my mom and I'm hoping things will ease a bit. There's still tons to do, but I'm really happy that um, we're making progress. So that that's good too. Unfortunately, with all that, I've been, I came back and I just crashed physically and emotionally from that last trip between the loss of Bear and with the family and all the last six months have done. It's been really hard and I didn't notice it right away, but eventually I did that I had a resurgence of symptoms in from protracted withdrawal. I know I'm seven years out now, just about seven years. It seems like that shouldn't still happen, but under extreme stress, we can still get this resurgence. So I started having different symptoms. I had my achesia came back, my paresthesia came back very strong, which surprised me. I woke up in the middle of the night gasping for breath again, which I had done in acute withdrawal and benzo belly. My abdominal distension was, I looked like I was maybe six months pregnant. So that really ballooned up. Tinnitus, tinnitus kicked in, some insomnia, some anxiety, but actually not too bad. That was, that was good and some cognitive difficulties, but I wasn't upset by this. And I wanted to share that with you because I think when I was starting to get these symptoms, I started thinking I was sick or of course, was it COVID or was it, you know, did I pick this up since, um, you know, all the, all the traveling we've been doing and all the exposure and everything like that, or was there something else going on? Was it just sheer exhaustion? <laughs> was it my diet? What was it? And once I realized that, wait a minute, and um, one of our um, longtime listeners had piped in and said, hey, this is, I wonder if you're getting a resurgence of symptoms. And when I said that, I was, when I saw that, I realized yeah, that's what's going on. And it was a relief because I realized and I understood what was happening. I know how to deal with this and I know I'll get through it and I know it will go away. It wasn't that bad because I know what's going on. Um, I'm familiar with it and it's already starting to ease a little bit. So I just wanted to say that as a positive thing, not as a negative that, yes, I still get a resurgence. I haven't had serious symptoms for a long time but they can still happen when we don't take care of ourselves. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was pushing myself constantly trying to take care of my family and stuff. And, and I needed to step back and start to take care of myself, which I have started to do. So anyway, that was the introduction. I don't want to talk a lot more because we have a really, I think a real fun feature. Today, our format is going to include our introduction, which you just heard and our feature. 
there is no moment of peace today, but it will return soon. I promise. It just didn't quite fit in with the uh, with the um, I don't know with the overall format of of today's podcast. I felt, and our feature today is Benzo Trivia. Um, like how much do you know? How much do you remember? Um, can you answer some other questions? I thought this would be fun. Um, between our battles with Benzos and so many of you are going through such a difficult time with your withdrawal. And my incessant rambling about my parents and our recent loss of bear, I really think it's time to balance things out by lightening things up a bit. So we're going to have some fun today with benzodiazepines, and I hope you enjoy it. Before we get too far into that, though, don't forget, I'd love to hear from you. Comment on our YouTube posts, on our podcast posts, via our feedback form at easinganxiety.com slash feedback. And... And while you're there, you might want to subscribe to the mailing list and even donate to support the work we do if you get a chance. Every little bit does help, and I really am grateful for that. It makes a big difference. And remember, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Okay. I mean, is, are any of you out there a Jeopardy fan? <laughs> I, I'm a nerd at heart, and my wife and I watch Jeopardy all the time. It's just something we do in the evening. We record it when it's on and then in the evening when we're, you know, after dinner or whatever, we'll flick on and we'll say, hey, want to want to watch Jeopardy? It's like, sure. And we'll, we'll sit down and watch it. Um, most of you, many of you know the passing of Alex Trebek, who was the host of Jeopardy, happened a year ago, I think or so. And um, Jeopardy has invited a parade of guest hosts and many tryouts for the job, I think, as a host. And um, and we've been watching them, and it's been kind of fun seeing how the different guest hosts do. <laughs> anyway, it got me thinking that perhaps a trivia game on this podcast would be fun, something different. And, you know, I just thought, okay, if I do a trivia on this podcast, what should be the category? <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> of course, we're going to talk about benzos. And we're just going to see what information you know. And if you like to, keep score. You know, one point per question, unless, of course, I say otherwise, but on average, one point per question. And be honest with yourself, no cheating here. <laughs> yes, the internet is very convenient. I know it is, but just see what you know off the top of your head. I'm curious. And let me know what your score is. I I'd love to see that. Put it, post it in the comments or, you know, send me a message on our feedback form. Let me know how you did on the comments. So I'm just kind of curious how everybody does. And if people played along, I think it'd be kind of fun. And one more thing, if you dispute any of the answers I provide, please let me know that too. You might be right. I've been wrong before, quite regularly actually, and I am happy to correct myself. If I'm wrong, I promise on the next podcast episode, I will say so. And and one more thing, <laughs> I'm doing this a lot, will this ever end? Anyway, please check out the show notes for references to the information that I provide in the answers. Let's actually get into this and see what we have. So, the categories today are benzos, the drug, anxiety, insomnia, and benzos, the benzo community, benzo withdrawal, and we will close out with true or false rapid fire. How does that sound? I'm just going to ask the questions after each one. I'll pause for about five seconds or so, and then I'll give you the answer that I have. Sound good? All right. Let's get started. The first category is benzos, the drug. And our first question is, benzos is short for... Yes, that was a give me. <laughs> Hopefully most of you got that one right away. Benzos is short for what? Benzodiazepines. That's one point for you if you got that one. <laughs> I just wanted to start off on a, on a good note so we can know the scores are already starting to build here. Next question. How do you spell benzodiazepine? No peeking. Try and spell it in your head. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, let's see if we got it. The answer is B-E-N-Z-O D-I-A-Z-E P I. Any. Hopefully most of you got that one too. That's a good one to have out there, but it's not an easy word to spell. I know some people have thrown an extra I in there and less E's or whatever, so don't worry. No problem if he spelled it wrong. I just wanted to see how y'all did on that one. Our next question. What is the most popular benzodiazepine on the market 
today. And the answer is Xanax or Alprazolam. It wins hands down. According to an article in Psych Central, 39.9 million prescriptions were written for Alprazolam or Xanax in 2018. Second on the list, anybody? Is Lorazepam or Ativan at 23.8 million. And those are followed by Clonazepam or Clonopin, Diazepam Valium, and Temazepam Restoro. Those are the top five, in case you were wondering. Next question. How many types of benzodiazepines are there? How many can you name? Now, not including Z drugs here. Only count, and we're only going to count the generic types here, not each brand name. For example, we just mentioned Alprazolam, most commonly known as Xanax. So Alprazolam is one type. Even though there are over 25 brand names for Alprazolam, we're just going to call it one type, okay? So this is, the, the good news here is this is multiple choice, okay? You don't have to get the number correct. So here are your choices. Is it A, 10 or less? B, 11 to 20, C, 21 to 30 types of benzodiazepines, or D, more than 30 types of benzodiazepines. Again, based on the generic name of these drugs, how many is it? A, 10 or less, B, 11 to 20 types, C, 21 to 30, or D, more than 30. Well, the answer is D. More than 30 types of benzodiazepines exist. If you wanted to count the total number of brand names in all the varying countries of the world, the number would be in the hundreds or more. So, you know, let's follow this one up with this one. How many types of benzos and Z drugs, we're going to include Z drugs here, can you name? Both generic and brand names are accepted here, okay? I'll give you one point for every three you can name, okay? So I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds here. Try to name as many types of benzos and Z drugs you can name, go. Okay there, how'd you do? All right. Some of these, I'm going to throw out some names here. There are many more that I'm going to list here, but how about adenazolam, alprazolam, bromazepam, camazepam, chlorodiazepoxide, sinalazepam, clobazam, clonazam, clo bleh, I can't talk, <laughs> clonazepam, and that's the one I took, and that's the one I stumble on. <laughs> that makes sense. Chlorazepate, cloxazolam, dilorazepam, diazepam, estazolam, and the list goes on. Those are just the generic names. For the brand names, they would include Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, Valium, Librium, Lunesta, Sonata, Ambium, Alprocontin, Zolam, Lexomil, Rizolid, Solium, Solitran, Dumalid, Insomna, and hundreds more. So how did you do on that? Did you get a couple points maybe? Maybe a few more? I hope you kind of racked up some points in that one. And if you didn't, no problem. This is just for fun. <laughs> okay. The next question is, what is the official classification name for Z-drugs? Z-drugs is the nickname for this class. What's the actual name? The actual name for Z-drugs is non-benzodiazepines. Hey, kind of catchy. It's non-benzodiazepines. The nickname Z-drugs come from their alliterative names, Zopoclome, Ezopoclome, Zoloplon, and Zolpidem, also known by their more common brand names, Imovane, Lunesta, Sonata, and Ambien. Now, while this class of drugs is completely different chemically from benzodiazepines, they appear to have similar side effects and dependence issues, and that's why we talk about them often. Next question. What was the very first benzodiazepine released to the public? Does methaminodiazepoxide sound right? Well, it's not. <laughs> I was just having fun. It, it is true. The drug was originally called that internally, but Leo Sternbach, the father of benzos, 
and the wonderful people at Hoffman La Roche. Yes, there is a hint of sarcasm in my voice there, sorry. <laughs> anyway, they changed the name before release to chlordiazepoxide. Still doesn't sound familiar? How about Librium? There you go. Librium was the very first benzodiazepine or chlordiazepoxide, either one would be accepted, released to the public. Now, how many of you said Valium or diazepam? Come on. I know of you if you did. Now, that's okay. Valium was by far more common than Librium. It's the second one that came out and created by the same people at Hoffman La Roche. So, anyway, let's move on. What year was the first benzodiazepine released to the public? And the answer is 1960. Yes, 61 years ago. They'd been around for a while. Librium was approved by the FDA in the U.S. on February 24th, 1960. One more question in this category. Benzodiazepines primarily act on which receptors in the human body? Now, if you get the acronym, you'll get one point. If you can come up with what the acronym stands for, you get another point, a bonus point. So the acronym is GABA. GABA receptors is what we were looking for, which is short for gamma aminobutyric acid. Two points if you got both of those. Now, let's move on to our second category. Anxiety, insomnia, and benzos. Our first question is, name as many anxiety disorders as you can. You get half a point for each one. So for every two you name, you get a full point. And I'm going to give you 15 seconds. These are actual anxiety disorders identified by the APA in the dsm 4 tr and I'll explain that later. But if you're looking at the DSM manual, that's what I'm using for this basis. Okay, so 15 seconds starting now. List anxiety disorders. Okay, let's see how you did. Now, as I said, I'm using the dsm 4 tr for this one. There is a DSM-5, but I don't have that one on my bookshelf, so I'm sticking with the 4 on this one. And here are some of the primary psychological conditions or disorders that fall under anxiety. Generalized Anxiety Disorder, or GAD. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD. Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, PTSD. Simple or specific phobias such as animal phobias, heights, deep water germs, dentists. Social phobias like social anxiety disorder. Complex phobias. Acute stress disorder. Substance-induced anxiety disorder. Adjustment disorder with anxious features, anxiety due to general medical condition, agoraphobia, and panic disorder. Those are the basic ones that were listed in that manual. Hopefully you got a few of those and got a couple points. Next question. Name two benefits to having anxiety. You know, we often talk about the downsides to anxiety on this podcast, but there are upsides. Can you name two of them? Well, there are actually several, and anything you came up with, I'm going to give you a point for, because, you know, I think there are many ones that I'm not going to cover here. But a few of these might include intelligence. Most people with anxiety are overthinkers and often very intelligent. Creativity is another one that goes hand in hand with anxiety and intelligence. Think Emily Dickinson, Sir Isaac Newton, Michelangelo, Van Gogh, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah went fee. Oh, Oprah went free. Sorry about that. <laughs> These and so many others have suffered from anxiety and are some of the most intelligent and creative people we know. Other benefits include safety. Anxiety makes us worry, and every now and then, that worry pays off. It may drive us crazy most of the time, but on occasion, our anxiety keeps us safe and alive. 
Anxiety can also make us more compassionate. We know what it's like to be fearful of the world around us. And that can make us more empathetic to others' suffering. And the list goes on. Hopefully you got a point or two there. Next question. Are benzodiazepines and or Z drugs beneficial for treating chronic insomnia? Well, the second most common reason benzodiazepines are prescribed is for insomnia, and it's the number one reason for Z drug prescriptions. Benzos do have a general hypnotic effect and can be quite effective sleep agents. Unfortunately, their effect is often short-lived. Most studies have agreed that long-term use of benzodiazepines is similar to placebo for helping a patient sleep. A review by the British Medical Journal in 2013 concluded that people taking a sleeping tablet on a regular basis average just 25 minutes more rest a night. Not that much. One exception to this is the treatment of parasomnia, for which benzodiazepines have been shown to be very effective. So, in general, the answer to this question is no. Benzos are not very effective in treating chronic insomnia with only a few exceptions. Let's move on to our next category. Our next category is the benzo community. I'm going to ask a few questions about what we call the benzo community. First one is, what is another name for the document titled Benzodiazepines, How They Work, and How to Withdraw? And who wrote it? Well, some of you might have guessed this one. <laughs> the more popular name for this document is the Ashton Manual, and it was written by Professor C. Heather Ashton. I'll give you one point for the title and one point for the author. If you haven't read it, please do so. End of story. You can learn more about this manual on our website at benzofree.org slash Ashton. Next question. What is the most popular online forum for benzodiazepines. Well, many of you probably came up with that one, and that is Benzo Buddies at benzobuddies.org. It has been around for a long time, still quite popular with thousands of online members. All right, next question. What do the initials BIC or BIC stand for? BIC stands for Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, another organization that is strong within the benzo community and has done a lot of good work. Now, if you said the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, you'd be, you'd be wrong. Um, there is not a the in the title. It's just Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, and they can be found at benzoinfo.com. Next question. What is the home of the Benzo Free Podcast? What is the name of our new home or our new organization name? Hopefully this wasn't too hard of a one. I actually said this earlier in the podcast a couple of times. Our new name is Easing Anxiety. Now the podcast name hasn't changed. It's just the Benzo Free Podcast is produced by Easing Anxiety. That's our overall website and the organization that we created for this. And you can learn more at easinganxiety.com. And since I'm self-promoting here a bit, <laughs> I'm going to do one more that is um, a blatant self-promotion. <laughs> what is the name of the book I wrote on benzodiazepines published in 2018? Now, you get one point for the title and an extra point if you can name the subtitle too. And yes, if you own the book, you can cheat. <laughs> I figure if you actually bought my book, you deserve to have a bonus points here. <laughs> so take a second. The title of the book is Benzo Free. <laughs> big, big leap there from the name of this podcast, right? And the subtitle is The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. Okay. Well, enough of the self-promotion. Sorry about that. Let's move on to our next category, which is Benzo Withdrawal. 
named five stages of benzo withdrawal, stages that are commonly referred to in the Ashton Manual and within the benzo community. Let's see what you could do here. Take a few seconds. Okay, so the ones that I came up with here are number one, inner dose withdrawal. These are symptoms that someone may experience between doses of their drug, more common with um, drugs of a shorter half-life. Number two is tolerance withdrawal, symptoms that somebody may experience while taking their drugs after tolerance to the drug develops. Number three, taper withdrawal, symptoms during your taper. Four, acute withdrawal. These are symptoms in the first 18 months after your last dose. Doth. Ooh, I'm doing good today. <laughs> after your last dose. Now, that timing may vary, but the most common one we've seen is about 18 months. That acute withdrawal lasts after your last dose of a benzo. And of course, five is protracted withdrawal. Symptoms experienced after that 18 month um, time has passed since your last dose. Hopefully that, that helps. Our next question is, list as many physical symptoms, not psychological, we'll get to those in a second. List as many physical symptoms of benzo withdrawal as you can. And I'm gonna give you one point for every five you can name here. I'm not gonna give you a point for every single one. <laughs> There's a lot of them. But every five you name, you get one point. Yes, depending on who you ask, there are over a hundred different symptoms of benzo withdrawal. But as for the more common ones, how many of these can you list? Go ahead, think about it for a second. Okay, let's see how you did. I break the physical symptoms down into six categories. Abdominal gastrointestinal, such as abdominal pain, appetite change, benzo belly, constipation groin, constipation, groin pain, menstrual difficulties, pelvic floor dysfunction, that kind of stuff. Eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, such as blurred vision, double vision, difficulty swallowing, dry mouth, sore eyes, dry eyes, light and sound sensitivity. Head and neck, which includes balance issues, dizziness, lightheadedness, headache, neck pain, slurred speech. Heart and lungs, which includes flushing, sweating, heart palpitations, overbreathing. Muscular, including aches and pains, electric shocks, fatigue, sprains, tics, weaknesses, convulsions. Nerve sensations, which includes altered sensations, hypersensitivity, numbness, paresthesia, skin rash rashes, formication. And immune and endocrine symptoms, including infections, breast swelling, menstrual difficulties. And there's a lot more. But for every five of those, give yourself a point. Now the following question is obvious. List as many psychological symptoms as you can of benzodiazepine withdrawal. Again, one point for every five you can name. I'll give you a few seconds here. Okay. Again, as with the physical symptoms, I break this down into six categories. First off, anxiety. General anxiety, GAD, hypochondria, panic attacks, paranoid thoughts, phobias, anything related to anxiety. Next, behavioral, such as anger, irritability, aggression, depression, obsessions, suicidal thoughts. Cognitive, such as cognitive dysfunction, memory dysfunction, intrusive memories. Excitability, such as achesisia, jumpiness, restlessness, restless legs. Perception, such as depersonalization, derealization, hallucinations, misperceptions. Sleeping, well, that's pretty easy, insomnia, nightmares. And social, such as agoraphobia and other social phobias. How'd you do on that one? Hopefully you picked up a few points on those two questions. Next question. There's a controversial drug that is used by some practitioners for rapid or even ultra-rapid withdrawal from benzodiazepines. What is the name of this drug? Now, this is a tough one, um, so it's a little harder. But the name of the drug is flumazenil. 
Now, it's a GABA receptor agonist, and claims have been made that it can help relieve the symptoms of benzo withdrawal. In fact, I've spoken to some people in the benzo community who have had success with this. Now, this drug is approved by the FDA for clinical use as an agent for benzodiazepine overdose and for post-operative sedation from benzodiazepine anesthetics. Still, as for withdrawal benefits, much more research is needed, including the long-term efficacy and possible side effects of this treatment. There are some dangerous side effects to flumazenil, including seizures. It is usually administered via IV and need to, needs to be monitored closely. Flumazenil does show some promise, but we still need to know so much more. All right, let's move on to the next question. Complete the following saying, everyone is blank. And this is in reference to an individual's experience with benzo withdrawal. When people ask me, what's withdrawal going to be like, or asking me questions about withdrawal, I often come back with this one saying, everyone is blank. And the answer here is different. Everyone is different. Perhaps the most common saying in benzo withdrawal. While there are some commonalities within withdrawal from different people, looking at someone and saying, that will be me, I'm going to have those problems, or something like that is dangerous and unhealthy. Everybody seems to have a different experience in withdrawal. And looking at horror stories, at, at, even at success stories, and saying that will be me, is probably not accurate. Your experience will be different than others. I almost guarantee it. Next question. Is it dangerous to drive while taking benzos? Yes. Benzos can affect driving or any activity that requires concentration and muscle coordination. Benzos slow down the workings of your brain and muscles, which increases your risk of motor vehicle crashes. A study published in 2000 estimated that benzodiazepines caused 1,600 traffic accidents and 110 driving-related deaths each year in the UK alone. And that number has most likely climbed since then. According to the Ashton Manual, studies from many countries have shown a significant association between the use of benzodiazepines and the risk of serious traffic accidents. Now, many studies do show that the risk does ease after taking the drug over a period of time. But since benzodiazepines should not be prescribed for long term, as most experts have stated, there shouldn't be an overtime with this drug. So please use caution with benzodiazepines. They can influence your ability to drive a motor vehicle. And that brings us to our last category. And this one is true or false rapid fire. We're going to go through some quick things here and see if the answer is true or false. You ready? You sure? Okay. <laughs> I am too. Let's kick it off. First question. The CIA once considered using benzos as a truth serum. True or false? The answer to this one is true. According to an AP article from 2002 to 2007, the CIA investigated midazolam in the interrogation of terror suspects. Next question. It is generally safe to take any antibiotic drug during benzo use and withdrawal. The answer is false. While most antibiotics are safe to take during this time, some classes, such as fluoroquinolones, like Cipro and Leviquin, can be dangerous and can lead to neuropathy, hypoglycemia, and other severe complications. Fluoroquinolones have a black box warning from the FDA, and if taken during benzo use and withdrawal, can cause complications. If you have concerns during this time about taking this class of antibiotics, please speak with your physician about a possible alternative. Next question. Benzodiazepines are often prescribed to prevent and reduce seizures. True or false? 
The answer here is true. Benzos are anticonvulsants and are quite effective in reducing seizures and are often used in emergency situations for this reason. Next question. Benzo withdrawal can be very difficult, but benzos can't kill you. The answer to this one, unfortunately, is false. The two most common causes of death linked to benzodiazepines are, number one, overdose. Benzos are very common in overdose deaths, especially when combined with opioids. The death rate from benzo overdoses exploded by more than 500 percent between 1996 and 2013. And benzos are now involved in more than 30 percent of all overdose deaths. And two, detox and withdrawal. Benzos are one of the very few drugs that can actually kill you when you detox. The other is alcohol. Going cold turkey off benzos can cause severe psychological effects, such as suicidal or homicidal ideation, psychosis, and hallucinations. The good news here is that this danger can be easily mitigated by using a slow, educated, and physician-supervised taper. Next question. Benzodiazepines were originally developed as tranquilizers for elephants and other large animals. The answer here is false. Although they have become common in use for animals, benzos were originally developed by Hoffman LaRoche for human use. Next question. Benzo withdrawal can cause false pregnancy, can cause someone to believe they are pregnant. The answer to this is true. Benzo withdrawal can cause some of the same symptoms of pregnancy. Perhaps the most prevalent of this is abdominal distension. And gender is not a factor. Men can also appear to be in the late stages of pregnancy during their withdrawal. The good news is that these symptoms dissipate over time and the patient returns to their normal size. Next question. The chemical GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. The answer to this is true. The effects of GABA are inhibitory, meaning it calms the system, it inhibits your system, helping ease feelings of anxiety, stress, and fear. Next question. The first benzo was called Librium, based on the word liberty, because the drugs freed one from chronic anxiety and fear. The answer to this is false. Actually, the brand name Librium was derived from the word equilibrium, not liberty. And that brings us to our end. But you know what? Let me throw one more bonus question at you. I close almost every podcast with three brief instructions. Three things I say just before I say, see you next time. What are these three things? And you get one point for each. Can you think of them? Good. And seeing that is the end of the episode, we'll just have to wait a few seconds for today's closing to get the answer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benson Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Oh, I hope you enjoyed our benzo trivia today, and um, I know I did. I wanted to do something different, something a little more upbeat, something not as negative, and just try, you know, a different take on things. And I, I hope it lightened some people's spirits. It may not have been as funny as I thought it might be going in, but hopefully it was informative and you enjoyed it. Now tally up your score and let me know how you did. 
And if you disagree with any of the trivia answers, please let me know. If you don't keep me honest, who will? Our next scheduled episode is episode 86. Thank you again for joining me today, and please let us know how we did. And now, the answer to that final bonus question, which is, keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.